Okay, so um, yesterday we had a, uh, one of the questions that we had yesterday was quite a technical question. Uh, so I thought I would answer that now. I said, okay, everyone, uh, are you happy to hear technical questions? Uh, yeah, I don't know who this is, but someone who kind of has a bit of knowledge of the details of the suttas. Uh, and uh, not all of it 100% relevant, but that's okay, because uh, sometimes we have to take questions that are not uh, 100% relevant as well. So I will try to see if I can answer this. So the question is, Dear Rajan, I appreciate very much if you can clarify the following. Yeah. And the one, what is the significance of the special relationship between consciousness and name and form? Yeah, so the, uh, this question, what this question is about is really about dependent origination. And uh, in dependent origination, uh, you, uh, you may know that... Uh, uh, dependent origination, you have the idea that consciousness uh, is the condition for name and form, uh, and name and form is the condition for consciousness. Uh, so they are mutually conditioning each other. Uh, and the way they are expressed in the suttas is that they are like two sheaths of reed, yeah, leaning on each other, and so they kind of they are dependent on each other for, for their existence. Uh, and the significance of this is actually, this is a very important part of uh, Buddhist philosophy, because what it means is that uh, consciousness can never exist on its own. Uh, it always exists in relationship with all the other mental and physical factors of life. Yeah? Life exists of consciousness, which is like awareness. Uh, then you have all the other qualities of the mind, the qualities of perception and the will and these kind of things. Uh, and then you have the physical reality or rupa. And consciousness depends on these other things for its existence. It cannot exist alone. Uh, and this is like, if you wish, the revolutionary insight of the Buddha. This is his insight. Yeah, in prior to Buddhism, everyone was talking about the mind existing by itself, talking about the Brahman that existed as a consciousness that was always present. And the Buddha is basically saying that's impossible because that consciousness always depends on other phenomena for, it, for its existence. And that's why you have the dependent arising of consciousness through uh, dependent, uh, the process of dependent origination. Uh, yeah? So consciousness depends on these other th all the other mental factors. Uh, so what exactly does name and form, what does that exactly mean? It's kind of an interesting thing, right? Why doesn't it just say the other aspects of mind and form? Why does it say name and form? And that name and form, uh, it means the aspects of an individual. Yeah? Who are you? as a person. Uh, and you will often say your name, right? That's kind of how you define yourself. I am this name. And then you have a certain shape. We recognize each other by our shape. So I see your appearance, then I know who you are. This is how we recognize each other. So name and form is like appearance and name. And appearance and name is what makes us into individuals. So this is how we separate each other out as individuals. You have this name, you look like this. That's how I know who you are. Uh, and so what this means, uh, the relationship between name and form and consciousness, what it means is that consciousness depends on individuality. Uh, consciousness depends on individuation. Uh, consciousness is always attached to an individual. Uh, name and form, that's the individual. Yeah, You have a name and you have a form. Uh, and consciousness depends on that. Uh, and so that means that consciousness... Uh, exists, does not exist as a universal background thing. It always exists in relationship to individuals. And again, this is a part of this idea of Buddhism that uh, is very different from the previous Brahmanical idea where they talk about a universal consciousness. The Buddha says, no, it isn't like that. Consciousness always relates to individuals. And so you don't have this kind of universal consciousness. And so this is um, it's a bit philosophical, but it basically is what distinguishes Buddhism from all other existing religions, as I was talking about before, and especially the Brahmanical religion, which was the main religion before the Buddha in India, is what makes it, makes it uh, different from that. Uh, I hope that makes a little bit of sense. Uh, and if not, never mind. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Try again next time. Maybe next year we'll do a, next year, I don't know if there is a, if there is a, if there is a next year, we can do a workshop on dependent origination. We can look at these things more in more detail. So that is the first one. Next one, question number two is, what is 
Adinasana vinyana. What you mean is anidasana vinyana is what you what you want to say. And uh, anidasana vinyana is a term that occurs twice in the suttas. It occurs in the Kevada Sutta, Diga Nikaya 11, in a verse. And it occurs in the Brahman Mantika Sutta, Majjhima Nikaya 49, uh, the um, uh, imitation of Brahma, where it also occurs in a verse. So it is a very rare expression. Two times in the suttas, both times in a verse. And remember what I said before, verse are really kind of, uh, they are for inspirational purposes. They're not to make precise teachings. Precise teachings, you don't use verse. You actually say things out, directly out as they are. Verse is always kind of uh, emotional to some extent. Uh, and so we should be very careful when we interpret these things. Uh, and we shouldn't actually rely on little teachings like that to understand the broader aspects of the Dhamma. We should understand the small minor teaching, the small minor terminology in line with the broader things, not the other way around. Uh, it's a very important principle of interpreting the suttas. Uh, and this is what Ajahn Brahm taught me. He, Ajahn Brahm, he went to Sri Lanka back in 1993 or 1992 or something. Uh, and when he was there, he visited some of the illustrious translators like Venable Nyanaponika. He was living at the Forest Hermitage in Kandy in Sri Lanka. This has kind of been you know, a famous place where all of some of the most important translators into European languages lived for a long period of time. And one of the uh, recommendations or one of the advices he gave to Ajahn Brahm was say, when you interpret the suttas, you should always interpret the minority statements, the rare statements, in line with the broader outline of the teachings. And never, you should never interpret the broader outline in terms of the minority statements. Yeah, so you know what is important in the teachings and you interpret it accordingly. So Anidasana Vinana is this tiny little thing. So we should not make it very important. Listen, this is the first point. The second point, when you do investigate it, and um, I have written on this, uh, a long article on this expression before, uh, and another monk at our monastery has, uh, and uh, basically he came to the conclusion that this means it's equivalent to uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, con the uh, attainment of infinite consciousness. Uh, yeah, and it does I think it was infinite in con consciousness that, that he uh, came to. Yeah, so in other words, we have the after the jhana states, so we have the immaterial attainments. One of them is called the realm or the sphere of infinite consciousness. That's what he said that this was equivalent to uh, in that particular, uh, in this particular sutta. So. so that I think is rough. Probably this is ballpark right. Yeah, this is approximately what it uh, refers to. Uh, so that's my. Well, I would say, but uh, even if that is wrong, it should not be taken too, too seriously. Number three, what is the meaning of the Dhamma is visible here and now? Yeah, uh, Visible here and now is like dit uh, eva dhamma, yeah? visible in the present life. Ditta dhamma, dhamma in uh, Buddhism, dhamma means like nature. Yeah. Uh, Dhamma has many, many different meanings, but the main meaning is something like uh, the lawfulness of nature or the reality of the world, Dhamma. Ditta means visible. So it means like the visible reality. In other words, the visible reality means this life, right? Uh, and it is opposed to future lives. Uh, the visible reality, of course, it must be this life. That which is not visible is the future life. It's called the Samparaika. And Samparaika is always contrasted with Ditta Dhamma in the suttas. Uh, so visible in this life means that everything in Buddhism can be attained in this life. You don't have to wait till after you die to attain things. And actually right now, you can attain a little bit of the Dhamma right now. Yeah? Just by turning the mind in the right direction, turning it towards generosity or kindness, you can feel the Dhamma working straight away if you get it right. Yes, the Dhamma is available in this life. You don't have to wait for the future. It is akalika. Akalika is one of these words as well. Yeah, Svakato, uh, Bhagavata Dhammo, Sanditiko, Akaliko, Ehipasiko, Opanaiko, Pachatang, Vedita, Bovin, Yuhi. Yeah, this is kind of the uh, how the Dhamma is to be reflected upon in the suttas. We'll come back to that particular expression later on. Uh, so that is the meaning of that one. And the last question is Is the extinction of craving Nibbana? Um, is the extinction. So, first of all, uh, usually in the suit, as it's called Tanha Kaya, 
And kaya means something like the ending, yeah, the ending of craving, tanha kaya. And is that the same as nibbana? Yes, that is the same as nibbana. When all craving is eliminated, yeah, that is actually the meaning of nibbana. Nibbana means the ending of the defilements of the mind. And sometimes the Sudas talks about two levels of Nibbana. The first one is you, when you become an Arahant, a fully awakened being. Yeah? Level number one, all the defilements are gone. Second level is when the Arahant dies. That's kind of the final Nibbana, sometimes called Pari Nibbana. It's like, like the two, two levels. But essentially, yes, you are right. So, uh, good. It seems like you are a keen student of Buddhism because those, those are kind of fairly kind of intricate questions, so uh, carry on. Okay. So now coming to the questions. Ah, one more question. Okay. So we take this one first? Oh, this is, oh, this is your map of sensory experience. Okay. Whoa, all right, okay. Sense experience, sight. Chakku plus rupa plus chakku vinyana is pasa. So the eye plus form plus eye consciousness is contact yeah, or experience. Mind, brain, brain, oh, okay, yeah, okay, that already getting a bit dodgy, I think. <laughs> Physical element. Physical element. Uh, mm. Okay, thought, memory, then attention equals knowledge or equals, uh, equals pasa in the mind, yeah, pasa, mano, mano pasa or uh, whatever it is called. Uh, uh, does the above make sense? Um, <laughs> I don't think the brain is not really required. Yeah, I mean, take the devatas. The devatas don't have a brain in an ordinary sense, a physical thing, uh, but they still have contact through the mind. Yeah, a devata can achieve samadhi, for example. They can practice the dhamma. But has pasa ever been described for the devas? Well, every, everyone has pasa, yeah? Pasa is, is a necessary condition for all beings to exist. So pasa is always going to be there. So I would say it's an interesting idea because you are right in one sense, yeah? You have the eye is the physical eye and then the brain is a physical aspect base for the mind, maybe. So in that sense, it makes sense. But I think the eye is not so much the physical eye. It is more like the ability to see, yeah? And that ability to see also exists for devas. Uh, they, don't have, they don't have a physical eye like we have. They have a different kind of eye. Uh, so it doesn't really necessarily mean the physical eye in, the, in the quite that sense. Uh, yeah? It means just having that ability of seeing, the ability of thinking or whatever. Uh, so uh, anyway, nice try. <laughs> Good. Uh, Billy, that's your name, is it? Billy? Uh, yeah? Okay, cool. I did. Now I know. I know. At least I know for now, but I, I do not... I do not um, I guarantee I will remember <laughs> next time around. It's, it's kind of... Um, anyway, I'm getting old. Memory is getting worse and worse. You know what it's like. Yeah. Hi, Arjun. The following question is from my daughter. Okay, the same kid that asked about the seven steps of the Buddha. Okay, so here we go. So these are more from the kids. That's great. So I'm glad the kids are, are getting opportunity to... Um, to hear these kind of things. So, hi Ajahn, I'm Ashlyn. Uh, is it wrong to tell a lie that doesn't harm others and yet benefits myself? <laughs> Meaning, is a white lie acceptable? All right, so, uh, so the, the answer to uh, these questions is a little bit, uh, is a little bit complicated because uh, in the Buddhist teaching, what if something is bad or good, it depends on your motivation. What is it that motivates the action? So why are you lying? Yeah? And if you're lying because you are greedy or you're angry, then it is bad, yeah, usually. And so if benefiting yourself, that is like a little bit greedy. Yeah? I want this for myself. This is my benefit. And so usually if it is for your benefit, then usually it is not a good idea. And it's going to be a little bit bad at the, at the least. But if it is truly a white lie, I would say that, for example, if someone, uh, if you lie out of compassion, yeah? For example, it's a very difficult situation, and unless you die, maybe someone will die because you don't lie, yeah? In that case, lying, if it can help save someone's life, uh, and you're lying out of compassion, then I would say it is more acceptable, yeah? 
So then it is coming from the right place. You're motivated by the right thing. So you have to ask yourself, what is your motivation? If it is anger, greed, stupidity, don't lie. If you are coming from compassion, wisdom, kindness, uh, then maybe it's okay. Even then, best to avoid it, but if then, it may be acceptable. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I've learned in science about communalism, where an animal gets benefits from the other while no harm is done to the other. Where one when an animal gets benefits from the other, while no harm is done to the other. Okay. Mm. Okay. So Buddha also mentioned that if we don't know what's right or not, we have to think if it harms ourselves or others. Example of my white lie. My excuse for being late to school was my grandma was ill. This is not true. <laughs> And it doesn't harm the school, the teachers, or myself by telling the lie. I had to lie to save myself because we have to love ourselves first, right? <laughs> uh, okay, so this, this, this is the mind is very sneaky. The mind will kind of find a way to justify anything, you know? So be very careful because the mind is very sharp. So don't always trust the first thing the mind tells you. Try to be wise. Don't be crafty, be wise. <laughs> That's really the thing here. And so in this particular case, obviously, you are, it's a self-interest. There's a kind of greed in this particular case. You don't want to be told off, and so you lie because of that. And that is not good. Yeah? If you have done something wrong, okay, own up to it. Yeah? And if you own up to it and you get told off, Told off a little bit, okay, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Sometimes everyone makes mistakes. It's not such a big deal. So uh, it is important uh, to avoid uh, these kind of situations. Otherwise, you're actually heading, heading a little bit in the wrong direction, right? I don't think it's a terrible big deal if you lie like that. It's a fairly small thing. Yeah? But if you can avoid it, even better. Yeah. yeah? So um, that's what I would say. Yeah? Um, so... Again, let me just come back to the more interesting point that you were making here. Yeah, that uh, uh, we should think if it harms ourselves or others. Uh, yeah. So uh, in this particular case, does it harm anyone? Not on the surface. It doesn't look like it. Maybe it harms you a little bit because you are hiding the truth. So maybe actually it does not good for you in the long run because you are kind of pretending something and maybe down the track someone finds out that you did the wrong thing and then you have to justify yourself and then it gets very complicated, yeah? If you start lying, very often we have to cover our tracks afterwards and that makes life very, very difficult and very complicated. So it could actually be harming yourself a little, a little bit if you do that. It could also harm maybe the other kids, yeah, if you are late. and Maybe they think that you are doing something dodgy. Maybe people get a bit jealous or, you know, it can always cause a little bit of disharmony when one person does something which other people cannot do or whatever. You don't know. It's hard to really tell sometimes. Also, and, the, uh, bad habit. I mean, white light leads to bad light eventually. Yeah, right. So bad exactly, habit. it is bad habits, yeah. It kind of, yeah. Exactly. And so, for that reason, sometimes we don't know whether something is bad for ourselves and others. And because we don't know whether something is bad for ourselves or others, the Buddha lays down this alternative way of knowing what is right and what is wrong. And that is to asking yourself, why, where are you coming from? What is your motivation? And that is the ultimate way of deciding if something is right or wrong. In other words, if you're motivated by greed or ill will, it's bad. Motivated by kindness and compassion, it's okay. That is what you should ask yourself. And in this case, I would say you are a little bit motivated by greed and self-interest. And that is why it is a little bit bad. Not terribly bad, but a little bit bad. I'm sorry to say that, but that is the reality. <laughs> so there you go. Good luck, Ashlyn. I wish you all the very best. All right. Are these things recorded? Uh, which one? Or, uh, the only the audio. So we have the audio, so we can pass it on to. Okay, excellent. Sadhu, good. Next question. Ajahn, I understand that to give up rebirth in the future, we need to let go of everything, even the Dhamma. Is this true? Hope to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. You will definitely hear my thoughts on this because this is coming now. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, uh, you have to, what you have to give up is you have to uh, give up any 
interest in rebirth. Yeah, this is really what you have to give up. And uh, giving up the Dhamma here, really, it, it is true, it does say that in certain sense, that you give up the Dhamma. But what that means, it means giving up attachment to the Dhamma. Yeah? You don't hold on to it anymore. You are relaxed about it. You know the Dhamma is true. You don't give it up in the sense that you don't practice it. You still practice it because you know it's true. But it's more like automatic. You don't hold on to it. You don't attach to the Dhamma. Yeah? And uh, more importantly, uh, the idea of giving up the Dhamma comes way down the path. It's a long, long way into the future. So you're probably way ahead of yourself, right? Don't worry about giving up the Dhamma. Hold on to the Dhamma right now because you need the Dhamma to even get started on the path. So, so one way of thinking about the Buddhist practice is like a hierarchy of holding on. So you hold on to something a bit higher, it means you can let go of the lower. So you hold on to virtue a little bit, it means you can let go of immorality, right? And then you hold on to samadhi, you can let go of uh, other stuff below, like the sensory realm or whatever. So it is a matter of hierarchy of attachment. You hold, go higher and higher and higher. And letting go of the Dhamma is just about the last thing that you do. Yeah, so if you are not close to being an arahant yet, uh, don't worry too much about giving up the Dhamma. It's too early to think about that. Uh. So let go gradually. If you think about letting go of everything, probably you get so confused and you don't know what to do anyway. So it's kind of a hopeless place to start. Start by keeping the five precepts. Start by being kind. Start by being generous. Start by doing a little bit of meditation. That is the place to start. And don't get caught up into the far future about what may or may not happen in the future. That is my recommendation. Okay. It's important to be practical on this path. Otherwise, we don't get anywhere really here. Ajahn, is there any decorum for right view in the Buddhist perspective, as different people may interpret right view differently? Decorum. Um, it, interpret right view differently. Well, there is the Buddha pretty much lays down what right view is. Yeah, Right view is an understanding of the Four Noble Truths. So this is right view. Uh, so that, this is a very important one. Uh, then there is uh, the more ordinary understanding of right view, which is uh, where the Buddha says there is the given, there is the offered, there is the sacrificed. Uh, yeah, this means that generosity is an important part, is a is a reality. Uh, there is fruits and results of good and bad actions. Uh, yeah, this is part of that uh, um, called the uh, aviparita dasana, non-distorted view. I think it is called. Is one of the Dasa Kusala Kamapat are the ten courses of right action. Uh, if I am bombarding you with Pali terms, it's because I do that on purpose. Uh, yes, that kind of uh, gives me, that's kind of always a wise, a little bit of Pali is kind of nice. I like a bit of Pali. And then it says there is mother and father, right? So this seems to mean something like uh, uh, the importance of mother and father uh, in one's life. Yeah, these things exist. Uh, it's a little bit, a uh, little bit um, controversial exactly what that means. Uh, and the last one is that there are, there's also the idea that there are spontaneously arisen beings. And of course, there is this world and there is the, is the other world. That's part of the right view. In other words, there is a rebirth. And then the last one is that there are ascetics and Brahmins who have seen with their own insight and with their own wisdom that there is this life and the other life. And this is like having faith in the Buddha, in a sense. Yeah? This is one aspect of right view. So if you don't have faith in the Buddha, that's kind of wrong view, in a sense. You haven't really understood what the Buddha is about. So these are all aspects of right view. Um, but a lot of these things, they come back to the things that we're talking about now. Yeah, Perceiving impermanence, uh, having perceiving metta, perceiving uh, friendliness in other people, having compassion. All of these things also are part of this idea of right view. Because if you have a right view, they lead to these qualities. And so you need to look for these aspects, these perceptions in other people. Yeah, that is part of the development of understanding the fruits and results of actions and these kind of things. It comes out of right view, ultimately, all of these things, developing the whole path. So, um, Yeah, so basically you can argue that all the suttas are just one big collection of right view. 
Everything you read when you open the suttas is an aspect of right view. So everything that we're doing here when we bring out the suttas is right view in a certain way. Uh, the Buddha tells us this is how you should see the world. Uh, this is how the path works. Uh, yeah, this is the nature of phenomena in the world. Uh, everything is really about these things. Uh, and so right view is everywhere really in Buddhism. There is going to be a little bit differences in interpretation, of course, because that's just the nature of human beings. No two human beings will think in exactly the same way. And uh, so, but uh, I think the basic ideas are clear enough. So. I hope. Anyway, dear Ajahn, Suki Hotu Ajahn. Excellent. Suki Hotu in return to you. I don't know who you are, but I, you know. Anyway, to all of you, maybe. Is it possible to elaborate further on the fifth simile of the person was to see delightful parks, wood, etc. in a dream, but when they woke up they couldn't see them at all? What was the Buddha trying to tell Potalia by giving this simile? Unlike the other similes on the hungry dog and the crow, etc., there was no element of danger in the simile at all. And further, where is the element of craving? Can you please enlighten me, Ajahn? Thank you, Ajahn. Um, I think the, it was a little bit cut off, yeah, because the, the full continuation was not given. So there was like a dot, dot, dot. That's why everything wasn't there. Yeah. But uh, the idea of the simile of the dream is that uh, when we think about the five sense world, uh, we always get it wrong. Yeah. It looks more beautiful in our mind. Uh, much more, uh, it doesn't have the flaws of reality when we think about it, yeah? When you reflect about the future, where you will want to be, when you reflect about your next holiday overseas, uh, when you reflect about your kind of new partner or your new house or new, new whatever, uh, you're only every, it always looks much more beautiful in the dream than in reality. Uh, and this is why uh, our ideas about the five sense world are never really realistic, yeah? They are distorted by craving, distorted by desire, because we want them to be in a certain way, because we are attached to these things. That is the problem. Yeah? So there is a gap. And if we can uh, be more realistic about what the five sense world is actually like, uh, it becomes less interesting. And that is the point here. Then we are seeing more the dangers. We're seeing more the problems. And we tend to uh, let go of it a little bit, and that is then what enables meditation practice to happen. Uh, yeah, so this is kind of the idea behind these things. Uh, so you just understand the flaws, yeah, the downsides of things. Uh, yeah, how interesting is that new car? Yeah, you get a new car, and it's really nice and shiny for a while, and after a few weeks, yeah, you start to look for the next car. Yeah, what is the next car going to be like? Yeah, and it's always like that, on and on and on. Yeah. Always something else. Yeah? No? Maybe? <laughs> if I, my answer is not good enough, try again tomorrow. I will, I will try again. Yeah? You have another, what is it, six days. You can keep on asking the same question every day if it doesn't work out. And then it's too late after that. So, um, yeah. Okay. Dear Ajahn, can you explain what is applied and sustained thoughts uh, uh, wherever they discourse about jhana? Okay, what is applied and sustained thought? Uh, so this is about the jhana attainments, and it, this is what you find in the first jhana. The first jhana is defined as satvitaka, satvichara. Vitaka is here applied thought. Uh, and vichara is sustained thought. And sa means with. So with vitaka, with vichara. This is what these things mean. And uh, these words have different meanings depending on context. And context is so important in the suttas. So the idea of vitaka, a general idea of vitaka, is like uh, thinking about things. Yeah. The idea, general idea of vichara is examining something. Yeah? You kind of uh, you keep your attention on it and you examine it by keeping your sustained attention. That's why it's called sustained thought or applied thought. But actually, when it comes to the jhanas, we are coming to the very end of these things. We are moving towards the point where vitaka and vichara don't actually exist anymore. We come to the second jhana, it is called avitaka, avichara. 
ah means not existing, it is without. Yeah? So it's viveka ja piti sukha savichara savitaka savichara, and then there is samadhi ja piti sukha avitaka avichara. <laughs> yeah? So uh, this is, so, so in other words, the very last. Um, the very last vitaka and vichara that we have uh, exists in the first jhana. So it is the most refined thought uh, yeah, just that, that you can imagine. So thought is no longer really the appropriate word uh, because when we think about thought, we think about words, we think about images in the mind, we think about all of this ver verbalizing of things. But in the first jhana, we have already gone beyond all the thinking and all of these kind of things. Uh, and because we have gone beyond the thinking, all that really remains is a slight movement of the mind. And this is what it means in the, in the first jhana. It means the mind is just moving slightly yeah, towards the object or away from the object. Yeah, that's what it means. And it sustains, holds on to the object a little bit. Then it moves back again. And what is the object? The object is just the bliss. So the bliss becomes a bit stronger. Yeah, and it wobbles a little bit like this. So it's not really thinking. So that's why applied and sustained thought is not a great translation. And uh, you find other translations like uh, applied and sustained. What is it? Um, initial and sustained application of the mind. That's another kind of translation that I sometimes find. But the Sujato has a kind of fancy translation. Now, what is it again, his translation? It's, Placing the mind and keeping it connected, that's exactly right, yeah. So that's, that's, that's the one there. So yeah, that's kind of more, you can see it's more, um, um, a bit more, um, yeah, nothing to do with thinking. Placing the mind is just a movement of the mind. Anyway, that gives you an idea what these things mean. Let's move on to the next one. Dear Ajahn, I would like to see clarification about the mind. It seems like the biggest sabotage. What is it really? Why is it there? Is it part of us? What is its relation to self? Thank you. Wow. <laughs> okay. So what is the mind? Yeah. And um, it, it, is, it is a very useful question, but your mind is basically your inner life, yeah? the life inside you, that's the mind. So whenever you are, if you close your eyes and you don't feel the body, well, what remains is really the mind. Yeah? As long as you don't, but the best way to think about the mind is what happens in meditation. And when you go deeper into meditation, the deeper you go, the five senses shut down. The five senses are not the mind, yeah? So let go of the five senses. What remains when the five senses are gone? That's the mind. Yeah? If you go to sleep at night, that's also the mind because the five senses are not, not usually operating. Yeah? The dreaming happens in the mind, yeah? That's the mind. So anything that doesn't happen through the five senses, that's the mind. So they are very closely connected because um, the mind also takes the other five senses as its objects. So you can hear and see through the, via the mind. That's why you can have dreams at night. Uh, yeah? This is the mind. The mind is actually so close to us uh, that it's pretty much there all the time. Uh, and the mind can become very refined. It can become pure bliss and delight. Yeah? This is what happens in meditation practice. Uh, and etc. etc. Why is it there? It is there because you were reborn. Yeah? So the mind is there because you got reborn, and that was the mistake that you made. That's why you are still here. Yeah? <laughs> so this is how it works. Is it part of us? Well, it is. I mean, if anything is part of you, it is the mind. Yeah? You can see that you can die, you can put away the body, and we can say the body is not so important, but the mind surely is really important. If you take anything as you, usually it is the mind that you take as yourself. What is its relation to self? Well, self is an illusion. Yeah? So the sense of self that we have, uh, that is uh, uh, an illusion. And so the mind creates this illusion of a self. And so our job on the Buddhist path is to see through that illusion and to see that there is mind, but not mind as self. There's a bit of, is there a, bit of a squeaking in the, uh, this, I think maybe it's a little bit too loud or something. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, 
still a squeaking, squeaking sound. I'm not sure what it is then. Yeah. Aha, that's better. Ah, okay. Okay, okay, good. Uh huh. Then it came alive. Okay, okay, okay. So is that the self or not the self? <laughs> it was a sleeve. That's right. It was a sleeve. Yeah, it was dreaming. <laughs> okay. Um. So. Is it working or? Uh, yeah, it's working. Okay, good. Uh, it's already 12 minutes past seven. It's quite 12 minutes past five. Uh, there's quite a lot of questions left over. Um, I will take those later. Is that okay? Uh, and we'll just do some meditation. It's getting late in the day already. So let's do some meditation just to finish off. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, great. <laughs>